Welcome to another Military History Verbalized podcast and today we focus more on the history side before, because beforehand we were usually mainly focused on the military side. And what does this mean? This is basically some kind of a meta podcast. I talk with another YouTube historian about how we approach the different aspect of history and our videos. And for this we have a special guest, Griffin Johnson, the armchair historian. Hello Griffin. Hey, thanks for having me on. And Griffin is a rather, I mean, you started, I think, in 2016, like I did, and you already have now 70,000 subscribers. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. uh, 71,000 71, right now. Yep. Excellent. And when this podcast is published, it's probably quite a few more. I looked at some of your videos and also your, your recent Q&A, and, and I saw, um, I th well, I think there's a certain difference how we approach history so mm -hmm. what is your thought on for instance the narrative or the explanation side because this is usually what i contrast is it more narrative driven on a story side or more on an explanation side mm -hmm. so what i'll say is um in my earlier videos um especially when i was a little more hesitant to i guess give give opinions or um include any sort of narrative. I would say a lot of my earlier videos were, were much more uh, uh, technical. Um, but recently, I would say my approach has been a little more on the, I, I wouldn't necessarily say uh, it's a narrative side because narratives can sometimes be a little dangerous when you're when you're talking about historical events and especially wars and conflicts. Um, because I mean, usually in a narrative or a story, you, you, you even have like a good guy or a bad guy, and, and you don't always want to portray that when you're talking about history. It can be very contentious. Um, but I would say that, um, like I said recently, some of my, some of my videos, um, I've been able to bring out more of a narrative through um, different quotes. And um, um, even one of my newer videos, I launched a series called War Stories. And uh, all that video is, is I took a, guy, a, a primary source, one guy's diary in Stalingrad and got a voice actor to read every day or um, every couple of days of, of the entries. Um, so in that way, it's almost building a narrative where, where we're using quotes. Um, but I wouldn't say um, that I'm trying to build a narrative through um, saying, hey, this guy's a good guy. This guy's a bad guy. Here's here's like a story arc and and making I, it's not put into, uh, you know, a story. It's more just um, taking primary uh, sources and, and um, uh, just seeing what the human aspect is of different historical events. Did you put these primary sources in in a context or do you edit some commentary here? Uh, so I. I'll put up all the dates. I give a little context before it starts um, and I illustrate the uh, narration just to help the viewer understand uh, what's going on. However, it, it was like our first time launching this the series. So I would say actually when you're watching it, if you don't have a little bit of that background information, it might actually be a little a little bit confusing. So in the future, we're going to be adding in adding in a couple more um, uh, parts in the middle where we're explaining exp explaining a few things, putting in um, little notes and details so the viewer can uh, better understand what, what's going on. Because my personal approach is usually with primary sources, I'm I'm very careful to touch them unless I'm very well aware what's going on. I mean, I've mm -hmm. started now uh, from the archives on my second channel, Military History for Adults. Basically, where, where I looked at some files from the German High Command, what they thought about the Second Japanese War and the performance of the Japanese especially. And then I, I, I looked at the summary and then I provided some some more orientation what we know what was going on or in some cases if this made sense or not for instance they they noted that uh, the japanese were not happy with some of the equipment for which i looked up and it was basically okay there was some change going on when the war happened so that was switching from one equipment to another and this probably was issued in this reflection because else the quality was rather high yeah so um, I do think adding that context is uh, is pretty important, especially because if you have um, cases where, let's say, that the German high command there was was saying that, but you couldn't you couldn't back that up, to use those sources and not um, go into some of the statistics and details um, that you you might be putting uh, forward like a false narrative or, or, or some false information, but. 
Yeah. Yeah, that that's a huge issue because I mean there was one video I don't mention which one which was sent to me by a lot of people who in the best case were conspiracy theorists and the worst case to the very far right and then some non-history YouTuber basically took part of the video and demonstrated it as a as a pure fact although it was pure propaganda from my standpoint right. it was like yeah well i was i was pretty annoyed because I, I i get i got sent this video like i think for for one year again and again by very dubious people and then suddenly mm -hmm. someone makes a huge video and puts some parts of it exactly into it and depicts it as a fact although it's pretty obvious that it was from the source who was speaking that it was very likely propaganda and people also take it at face value again this is especially a major problem with the second world i mean one of the better known cases from 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 the book side is death traps by uh, death traps by belton cooper but with, mm. which is all which is relatively minor in its impact because it's basically stating that the shermans were, that the sherman was a bad tank or a death trap whereas well some other other statements are usually of far higher political problem uh political um, mm -hmm. reach let's call it this and generally um you you said in the early on you were more on the technical side and now you're more on the on the let's say personal side what, right. why why the shift um well i would say so um i had a discussion with my friend alex i said i'd mention his name um and he said um he said to me when we were looking through some of my earlier videos um or this was when I only had those videos up. This was earlier on in my channel. And he said, yeah, I, I sometimes I can't really get into some of your videos because I, you know, I don't even watch YouTube um, for a lot of history because if I want to learn something, um, if I, you know, I don't want imp to have a couple statistics thrown out in five minute video because I can't get much from it. So he says, um, if I do what, if I really want to learn something about history or, or just learn something in general, I'll probably get a couple books and uh, resources and dedicate a lot of time to it because I don't think some of these larger historical events um, can be summed up so quickly um, with just, you know, throwing a couple statistics around sort of loosely and um, you don't always get the full full thing. So to me, I was thinking, OK, um, so if people if, if I'll make the assumption that if people really want to understand all of the hardcore facts, either a will create, you know, a 20 minute video, like in some cases you do, where we're going over a lot of analytical stuff, which has um, yes, a certain audience for it, or um, go with more of the stories and the personal feel, which has an audience for it. And I feel like putting that right in the middle, um, you can find like a sweet spot where you're putting in your statistics to back up the narrative. But when you're when you're sort of awkward in the middle where you don't really know where to put in the quotes and um, and or you're not putting in any quotes and then you have some statistics and you're not backing them up or you or you have narrative and you're, and you're not backing that up with statistics either way. Um, I think that can be um, somewhat bad. So so I've taken um, more of the approach of of, of bringing in that human feel um, just because if you're a guy who wants to learn about history, um, you're not going to come to a five minute video to learn about the topic. You'll either go to one of your detailed videos that that's much more in depth or you'll, you'll pick up a book. So I figure it's just more, more, um, it, it gets more entertainment value mixed with the education. If, um, if you provide, I, I guess more of a human feel and, and it's more relatable. I just think it's a, a different approach to things. So basically it's, it's more on a introductory course. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, or, or even if you, if you've already learned a lot about that subject, I think you can learn a little more because, on top of the introductory course, so let's say I did my my video on um, I have a lot I have a lot of a lot of videos on different wars, and of course you can't fully understand a video uh, a, all the details of a war in five minutes, um, but you might um, be able to walk away if 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 you're even an expert in it um, with some of the some of the quotes we provide of different accounts and how um, uh, how people were really affected in some of these historical events, good or bad. Um, or, um, you know, as you mentioned, it could act as an introductory um, video. So we're, we're sort of providing, trying to provide to both audiences. Okay, yeah. So basically an introduction, also a summary or a kind of refresher if people already know it and adding some new facts and, and details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I found it quite interesting because one of my patrons actually noted to me, yeah, imagery, there's one problem with the videos. They are not an entry drug. <laughs> 
So, mm-hmm. so they are mostly for people who are already into the into military yeah. history to a certain degree and they want to have more. Or sometimes to people who, I mean, I had actually people that noted once that said, I, I like your videos because you people who don't know too much about it can understand the stuff, but also people who know stuff about it are not offended because you're treating everything um, right too down. For me, for me, it's always the always to be in the middle, like trying yeah. to make it for everyone, mostly if they agree to a certain level. Because I have very balanced viewpoints sometimes, which where I often state, for instance, on my Rommel video, I say in the end, sometimes there are no easy answers. And I don't provide one. And there was actually, I think it was only one comment, but he said, yeah. And so what is the final conclusion? This is missing. And I'm, yeah, right. There right. is no easy answer. And everyone is up for himself to say, okay, this is my yeah, opinion yeah. on this. Um, and that is sort of part, like I, I, I'll have a lot of trouble with that too, is um, it's sort of the art art of teaching is um, you have to, you, you have a bias because you know all of this information. So when you're writing, sometimes you're making the assumption that the viewer already knows a lot of things. And so there, there can be a disconnect between people who just aren't that familiar with the topic. And uh, you, as, as in some cases, some of these people are experts where they have you know, they've, they've gone to school for over like 10 years or something. And they're, they're so far ahead in, in a, a certain field that everything will, will go over, um, go over the viewer's head because they're just not uh, as well versed. So, yeah. And, and for, for the, um, how, how do you see your channel more on the entertainment or more on the education side? Um, well, I, I think we're trying to find a, a good mix between the two, which like I said, c- can be somewhat dangerous because, making making um anything educational like fully entertainment if you're just sort of like trying to sensationalize things i think that can be dangerous um but um we're we're trying to push on the edu- uh, or on the entertainment side cuz like i said if if someone really wants to learn about something like very in depth they they either need a detailed analysis of it or they'll go to um like large textbooks or or professors um to, or, you know, take a class on something if they really want to understand it. So we're trying to fill, like, I guess for a different audience, an audience that, um, like I mentioned before, if, if you're new at it, you can easily just pick up, you know, a basic overview. And if you're, um, if you already know about um, the historical topic, you can watch it more as entertainment. And it's, it's going to be less of all of the statistics that you've already read about and more about, like I said, the, the human feel and the, the personal accounts that you may have not uh, seen. Did your audience actually notice your shift in, in, in this approach? Uh, well, I think I, I'm not really sure yet because um, it's it's been sort of hmm. I think I think some people have noticed it. One one thing that I did was add a um, something that is like a direct shift is I uh, started like appearing in the videos on video camera, um, which quite literally adds I guess a, a human feel to it. Um, so I think people have certainly noticed that, and, and people have certainly noticed that we've. Uh, especially with the launching of the War Diaries series uh, or the War Story series, uh, people have noticed we, we've been trying to um, make the history a little more human. Now, an- another aspect, you are majoring in history as far as I know. Is this correct? Yes. Yep. So what is what did you notice on the on a university side? I mean, you also watched some of my videos. Do you see a, a, mm. some kind of difference in... I mean, of course, I'm not a professor or lecturing on a university, mm-hmm. But do you, do you see a certain difference, like, because you're from the United States and I'm from Austria, so do you see a certain difference in the approach there? So I can actually say that, <laughs> I can say that um, in my first year of university, I was majoring in business. And so I didn't get to take any history classes. And I just switched to, um, I just switched to history the end of my second semester because I realized I didn't, I didn't want to go into business. So in terms of university, I, I can't say too much. Um, maybe in, I guess, high school if, if we if we want to talk about that, I, I don't know if that's as appropriate uh, a comparison, but um, I, I what I really noticed is it, I think it, it's up to the the class or the professor. I've had teachers and professors who, if they're not enthusiastic about it, they're going to give you the textbook curriculum. They're going to throw a bunch of dates and statistics at you, which is a huge turnoff for a lot of people who want to get into history or, or people who don't don't know much about history. It's a huge turnoff for them. There are certain professors who do a very good job at um covering all aspect, uh, aspects. Um, I would say your videos are, are, are more on the side of um, um, a lot of like detailed analysis, like I said. Um, not all of them, but um, I guess the ones I've enjoyed uh, watching. 
um, as a person who knows a little bit more about history and wants to go a little more in depth. Um, in terms of differences, um, I would say, at least in my high school, a lot of teachers and professors stick to the books. The books are pretty much just overviews. Uh, they don't go into a lot of the detailed statistics. A lot of these professor or teachers I've had in high school, um, once again, not the best comparison, but um, a lot of the teachers I've had in high school don't know much about the military equipment, don't know much about the types of tanks. Um, a lot, I, I hear a lot of generalized statements. That's just been my personal experience in, in high school. Um, so I appreciate that you're coming with a different, much more detailed view of um, all of the different types of equipment and specifics. And I think uh, a lot of teachers, at least in, in uh, my high school would give very broad overviews and uh, in many ways just just throw out some st a lot of statistics and dates, a lot of memorization. Yeah, I must add here, even people who know quite a lot about history are turned off by dates and statistics most of the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's this, there, uh, in my university experience, yeah, um, I did a, a master's in history. I can remember one instance, one instance in an, in an oral exam, and we had, in history we have mainly oral exams, where I was asked for one date, and I think it was for the consul in Constance, and it was, the course was, um, I remember the professor, and the course was um, the church in the Middle Ages. And I mentioned mm -hmm. the year, and then I told him the years of the follow-up councils, and he noted, okay, it was already enough with the first one. <laughs> this was mm -hmm. the only time I remember that I was asked for a date. For, for us, it was always at university, It's not about the dates. It's about understanding the processes, the development, everything else. And, right. and a funny aspect is statistics were rarely or never brought up. And which is my experience in general, that the humanities, especially history, actually have a quite, I would say, an, an aversion or a problem with, with statistics. They only come up mm. in military history actually at all. Right. I think I remember the only other course I remember where statistics came up was about the, the social welfare state. I think this was also where a few statistics came up, but outside of that, basically nothing. But of course I have a computer science background and I, I, for that, for that, I like numbers. And, and mm -hmm. sometimes if you look at numbers, you, you get a better understanding of some aspects. Certainly. Yeah. And of course, without the proper context, I mean, I said this, I think in one of my earliest videos, numbers without context. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit dangerous. It's a bit like trusting politicians. It's right. It's... <laughs> right. No. And, uh, yeah, I, I would, I would say, yeah, most of the statistics that I've heard are, are in more of the, uh, military history, um, that that'll be mentioned. Um, but yeah, there, there I think just, like I said, there, there's, there's been a little bit of an issue just because a lot of the curriculum has to be streamlined for everyone to get. So, you're not going to get the best. I'm sure it's different in university. I, I, like I said, I don't have uh, much experience in taking uh, some classes in uh, on history in university yet. But um, in high school, I, I, it felt very streamlined. I, I noticed. Yeah, yeah. F f from what I heard so far about high schools in the United States, yeah, I, I didn't hear any particularly uh, positive aspects. But I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not a particularly fan of our high school or or education system. I. Uh, also quite some some issues even with our history education at university and mm -hmm. yeah so it, it, it's generally the approach how, how stuff is done because i mean for instance with with the dates and statistics i remember for instance one class in about the 30 year war and we had presentations to do and and one guy or gal walks up and he or she had a a biography of of some dude and so it was not a real major dude it was yeah it was important but not that important and, and she basically where well, he started with um birthday on the day exactly and and the day of death exactly and year and it's like yeah uh, i can read wikipedia for this and yeah and, exactly and, right. and without the context i mean it was a the 30 years war is so insanely complicated and everything and this was a seminar so, and and it was like Basically, after five seconds, my, my brain switched off because I knew this person can't present the case because right. give a basic overview. Why is this person important? Yeah. What did he or she do? What, what we need to get like like five points why I should know about this person. What's the mo most important thing? Right. But telling me of something in the who lived in the seventh, uh, 17th century 
on the day exactly when he was born and when, when he died is utterly unimportant. There are very yeah. few birthdays. I mean, for an Austrian <laughs> or a German, there's basically one birthday you have to know more or less because to avoid certain problems. But besides that, usually birthdays are very, very irrelevant in any case. Right. I mean, yeah, um, unless unless their context to what the actual so let's say they mentioned the five things that, why you need to know this person unless the dates were in con like as adding to context about that person maybe the date um, of death was because they they died really early on and that affected yeah, they, I don't know the, the army that they were commanding because it had to that would be that would I would understand that but, but then you would say he died with twenty five right <laughs> right yeah this is this is the short because I yeah. I usually get. When you have to make an important point, but what is the easiest way? For instance, I always like, when I go with Operation Barbarossa, I rarely say the track is the 22nd of June. I usually mm -hmm. say summer 1941 or even 1941 right. because right. it's not really important on which day of the month. I mean, sometimes I say just the month, but usually I, I keep the day out. And yeah. sometimes, of, of course, the, the birthday is relevant. I mean, we had once in Latin, actually, our Latin teacher told us something about the Caesar introduced a, uh, a, a law. And I think she said it was in, in 82 BC. I'm not mm -hmm. entirely sure about the date. And, and then I looked it up and was like, he was born in 100 BC as far as I remember. So I, I don't know if the, this add up, but basically he would have passed this law at 18. Then I walked up to her and told her and, and she said, yeah, yeah, he was rather young. And then I said, yeah, he would have only been 18. And she said, oh, oh well, yeah, maybe I looked this up. <laughs> and then, then she looked it up and told me, yeah, this was another one. And, and I, I later on read there was some, someone who was almost, he was always also called Julius Caesar or something, or he was from the same dynasty or something. And he mm, was a mm -hmm. few years earlier. But even there, the day was irrelevant. It was mostly about the year. So... In this case, I would say if it's important that he or she died early, I would go with the year. Right. Or outright state died with 25 or died right. with 30 or, or way too early or got really old or something. And and, and, and unless edited. you're... Unless you're compiling a detailed timeline, which, by the way, you shouldn't be watching a YouTube for doing yeah. that. Um, it, it it just seems somewhat irrelevant to, to pick very specific details, whether that be um, uh, specific dates or just... Um, just very specific things uh, in history that you, you usually want to look at the broader view, not neglecting details that are important, but um, you, you need to understand everything and, and sitting there and wasting time on memorizing a bunch of birthdays. That that's, that is, yeah, that, that seems like a waste of time. I, I would even remember in high school, um, we took, we would take an exam after each chapter and all the exam would be, it, it, it sounds like it sounds comical. Um, we would, it would be matching and it would be a list of about like a hundred terms or, or maybe a little less than that. And you would just match the people to dates or match the people to um, certain events, which is okay. But like just doing that and just memorizing and not understanding why that person was connected to an event or what happened on that event or who that person was really that that's a big issue. If you're just sitting there memorizing, you're, you're not learning at all. You know? what, what do you mean with matching? You had like um, a year given and then three names and yeah, then you marked yeah, it? Ex <laughs> yes, exactly. That's, that's, I are... would call this elementary school level. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was, and we would have, we would have bigger, I, I wouldn't call this an exam. These, these were, the, were the quizzes that were given after ah, each okay, chapter yeah. to make sure. Yeah. So the, the, the exams themselves um, would have written portions and essays and, and multiple choice and the standard stuff. But we would all, we would get a quiz after every single chapter and have to do that and that seemed to me you know th there's so many better ways to do it um, just forcing kids to memorize um, what was in the textbook uh, you need them to learn it and a lot of them don't want to learn it but um, it, that the, 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 the answer to that is not by just forcing them to memorize dates it's to teach it maybe a little better I, I, I don't know <laughs> yeah I mean if, for me it's it's that's my main focus I try to focus everything on understanding so and if uh, for understanding it's important that I dig to a lot of data, then I will dig to a lot of data. If it's important that I change the barrel on an MG42, I will change the barrel on an MG42. And, and this should be the main approach. I mean, this general, 
what, what I see to a certain degree and which is reflected by the whole uh, political debate about fake news and everything is that there should be first on how, how do I treat my students or pupils? Do I treat them as, a, as adults or do I treat them more or less like children? Because if I mm. should match some aspects to another and we both agree it appears more like elementary school level, then it's probably more an approach to, yeah, to to treating them like children. The other aspect is in a, in a time where you can in five to 10 seconds get basically most important dates and data like what is the length of this rifle what was the speed of that tank or something memorizing data is completely irrelevant because a computer will do it way better right right and, exactly and getting the whole context is something which computers still right. have a, quite a problem but but understanding why certain aspects happen to the whole the whole inner workings of system and we in university did this did the mainly my notes basically in university were one term, then usually an arrow to the next term, which meant this influenced that or led to that. And I had only one professor in, in medieval history, which was just full of dates and names because he right. listed only information. And, and then I read up all this information. I learned a lot, but it was basically, yeah, it was basically all the crusades included from the very beginning and I can't remember anything of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I learned everything for it. I think it was one of the toughest history courses. I mean, you could choose, but I intentionally cho chose that guy because I knew he was one of the few guys who didn't give a straight A on everything. So mm -hmm. I, I wanted this like an honor badge. And it was, and, and then later on I saw, ah, I forgot nearly everything. I mean, if I read up on it yeah. again, it will come back to a certain degree. But that amount of data, these, these, I mean, this was probably one of the few history exams where I had to study weeks, were basically completely wasted. Yeah. And yeah, and I remember when I was in high school, um, like early on, um, when I and I was just getting into politics, my first thing was, oh, I'm just going to memorize a bunch of statistics and I'll prove everyone wrong. And I would go home and I'd, I'd memorize a bunch of stati statistics and a week later wouldn't, wouldn't remember a thing. But if I read up on a certain ideology or maybe the history of that ideology, how it was influenced and what exactly the goals are, those are things I still remember today. So um, not only are statistics are, are rather, sorry, uh, not, not only are dates, uh, just memorizing dates and that sort of thing, uh, impractical um but you know it, it's a waste of time and, and and you don't fully get the understanding of the event by simply memorizing a date but i think we both agree on that yeah, yeah. It's, it's basically as did in one video you you have to get the, the causality right and then when you when you have the causality and everything in order then you can easily add the dates later anyway and for some people the dates will never be of importance mm -hmm. right so one question um that i wanted to ask you you know, I, I talked a little bit about how I've changed my videos, um, you know, from a year ago to now. Um, I'm just curious what your, um, since you have a lot more videos and um, a lot more followers, uh, you've built up your channel a lot bigger than mine right now. Um, what what if, uh, what are some things that you've learned over time um, just from uh, some, of, some of the mistakes you've maybe made in your older videos to how you do things now? Well, very early on, I had no clue what I was doing, basically. And I, I think the very first two videos, I basically only used Wikipedia. I moved very fast away from mm -hmm. this. I mean, it was it, the channel more or less happened out of an accident. And since it got momentum and then then my my natural aggression sets in and I keep moving forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So early on, I, I was way too much concerned about getting everything correct. And I, I think in the early, I think in the early 10 or 20 videos, you will find in the description notes on accuracy and like five points and very well explained why I rounded this number, why I didn't round this number. Right, right. And, and, and stuff like this. And, and what I noticed, for instance, there was one video, I think it was the Soviet, um, Soviet tank division. And they explicitly stated in the beginning of the video that this is a theoretical organization and probably not happened in, in real life this way because it was in summer 1941. So, and, and some people just ignored that statement. So I, mm -hmm. I often removed statements like 
this or I put them now on screen. For instance, nowadays, if I use, for instance, a model of a, if I talk about the early Panther version and I have only a model of the late Panther, I think I did this on the Gutierrez video, then I have an asterisk and note on a cursey, this is a late Panther, mm -hmm. not an early one. So trying to both be keeping the accuracy up but also not wasting time while talking about it. Right. So, right. so this is, this is my, my main, my main balance always the time, how much detail, how much accuracy and how much make it approachable for other people as well to not get lost in too much detail. Mm -hmm. so, uh, one thing that you mentioned was, um, Wikipedia early on and, um, uh, we always we always hear from teachers and professors all the time all the time that Wikipedia is a completely invalid source for everything. And if you're caught using, there's a, I think there's memes now online where it shows a teacher it shows a kid getting beat up and the teacher doesn't care, but a, a kid's using a Wikipedia source and the teacher flips out. So how is how is that in in Germany compared to um, what we have? You know, like I said, a lot of teachers and professors are very against Wikipedia. This is very interesting question because. Um... I have basically, I have done, I've done a, a master's in, in computer science and a bachelor. And in history, we don't have a bachelor, but the bachelor is basically included in the master's. So I started in 2001. Back then, Wikipedia was not really an option. And oh, it was slowly developing. And I think, and it's very different whom you ask. For instance, I asked my, my thesis advisor for computer science if I can use Wikipedia articles. He said, absolutely, yes. But this is something different in the in the engineering and in the in the technical fields and also in the sciences. Usually, Wikipedia is since it's mostly about hard facts. It's actually very well regarded from what I noticed. I mm -hmm. mean, there's also Thunderfoot um, is a, a rather big science you could say YouTuber, and he uses Wikipedia all the times in his videos. Mm -hmm. But for the humanities, it's something different. Of course, there are many approaches to this because for the humanities, what I noticed very early on, in at least this is the case for, for Austria, um, the professors aren't dependent on students. The, pro the students are mostly nuanced. Whereas my thesis advisor actually went into a class in computer science and told us straight off the bat, I don't like teaching, but... I need you to write papers for me. Thus, I will do the, everything I can to provide you with the best course that is possible. And, and he spent a lot of time, he was a great teacher and, or, or professor. And, and this is the thing, and he also mentioned this very interesting aspect for, for, for history. I had like, I think I had a list of 30 thesis topics. At one point I stopped adding them. For computer science, after seven years, I had one idea. And, and I was like, is this weird? And one day, my thesis advisor actually mentioned this, I think maybe in this class. He said, when he was a student, he had no idea on, a, on what thesis he should do. But now as a professor, he has tons of thesis ideas. Yeah. But he has no time anymore. And, and, he could, right. and in, in history, it's different. So my conclusion was from this, in history, to a certain degree, for the most parts, the professor are accumulating information all the time. And they are doing this for decades. So every student that comes up is usually on a complete different footing and can get there, at least back then. Nowadays, with the internet and everything, this has, has changed, certainly. And I'm not sure if it's also changed how they work together. Also, it's Austria and Germany were basically... It's frowned upon if you are on the university and you write a book that the general public can understand, mm -hmm. to put it mildly. It's basically, I lately tried to, to translate some German quotes into English and it's basically not possible sometimes because there are like three or four commas in the sentence. And I also noticed that my sentences I write in English are way too long. So, so and... And then after I finished my studies and I went to, to work on a startup and some other stuff, I went back to university to do some law and business courses, classes. I think this was mm -hmm. two or three years afterwards. First of all, I noticed it was way more school-like, but this was also due to various other changes. And then there was this guy, I remember him, and he went out there and said, 
outright, Wikipedia is not a source. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. So, so, and, and this is, now there are several aspects here to consider. First off, it's, is this aspects of the professors that they get the students to read their books because previously before Wikipedia, everyone had to read the books anyway. There was no other way. So you could say, is it, is it an aversion against Wikipedia or is it basically read a fucking book? <laughs> yeah. And, and the other aspect is of course, um, yeah, how well it is it because in humanities, um, they quote Wikipedia and then they add a source from the 1960s. And if you look, for instance, at the Battle of Britain, how much bullshit is out there with like the RF was closely before breaking and which gets repeated over and over again and which is basically demystified since I think the early 2000 at least. I mean, over it, the uh, myth and reality of the Battle of Britain rather early mm -hmm. and and it's, it's repeated since then. But I still get a lot of comments, I think probably... Every two weeks I get a comment that if the Luftwaffe hadn't shifted to bombing London and yeah, but basically all the airfields were not in bad shape and the RF was not nearly anywhere, but it still gets pushed out in many other narratives as well. So, so here's the, here I can't say what the actual stance of various professors is. I guess it also depends on the professor. It also depends on the course and Mm -hmm. I was actually talking to a professor about a potential um, PhD and, and, and he asked basically that there should be something like um, a critique of sources, the mythology, I don't know how you call this in English, critique, but it's lacking. We don't have one for, for internet sources because we have, mm -hmm. we have all our methodologies basically for how to deal with, with how, you, how you work on, with oral history how you work with primary sources, how you work with memories, how you work with archives, but how you work with internet sources, how you classify them and everything. And for me, actually, it was never a, a big issue because uh, for me, it feels intuitive when I take this or this side and, and I see more or less, or maybe it's kind of stupid, I feel in a certain way how legitimate one page is more or less which also sometimes comes down to my computer science background because I wouldn't say I see the metrics, but I can tell sometimes just from, from the appearance, from the design, from everything else. Usually I can determine rather fast, is this, a, is this more a business side? Is it more a, a researcher side? Is it more a shorty side? Is it more a hobbyist side? How old is it? what happened there for me, how much advertising runs there, what kind of advertising runs there. So, so I have a, a basically intuition for, for, because I've seen so many web pages and mm. I also, I also, and I was also trained basically in, in old media all the time. So I usually s stay away from online sources and move completely to the to the book side which was also a reason because some people sometimes complained about wikipedia i think i, I used it a second time well, i mean basically not a second but one major time i used it again was on the on the the brand versus spandau controversy mm -hmm. because here it made sense it was like about how many countries use the mg42 or the the variant of it, the MG3, or another variant of it, still, and it was like, and I knew already that this machine gun, this basically the derivative of the MG42, was used all over the place, and I, I just needed the proper source, and it was also in the, of moving from Germany to Austria. So I looked up Wikipedia, because this is some information I know, I can search for several books to finally find it, but it's very unlikely because it's a very, let's say, a nerdy information. In how many countries is this machine gun or a variant of it still used? I, I, I can't even tell you in which book I would find it. I would definitely yeah, go yeah. to Wikipedia for it. Right. Yeah. So, I, yeah. And, I, and, and one thing you mentioned a, a while ago, too, is um, even that um, it, just because I, I think there is there is somewhat of a misconception that people think just because it's a book. Um, it's automatically a superior source than than really anything on the internet. Internet, um, but yeah, I, I definitely think that some things are reserved to books. I, as I mentioned a while ago, if if you really want to get in depth with things, usually you want to get 
a, 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 an assortment of books. And um, if you have very specific questions and that sort of thing, um, even even some general general questions, I think the internet is a, is a, a good source um, to use. Even even Wikipedia, as you mentioned, to find find those specific questions, like how many countries we're using a, a yeah, weapon. Yeah. It's it's basically yeah. an encyclopedia, but it's not for understanding. Books for for me are for understanding and for context, and Wikipedia is basically for basic knowledge. So and and nowadays, basically back to the to the main question about my my channel. So, what I'm doing more now is way more. Initially, I didn't quote at all. I didn't quote any books or something, and I'm going more into quoting these various sources because. First, my audience seems to like it, and I also noted lately right. Chifton noted that he likes that, and and also another historian, which should be on a podcast soon. Uh, he also noted that he likes this because we are more or less like yeah, we live in the era of fake news. Let's call it this way, and a lot of people don't back up any of the statements, and and so I think this is a, a good change for people, and also some yeah. people that wanna read more, want to read into books or or wanna get. Some interesting quotes. They are really after this, and and for me it's also, yeah, I, I like this. I, I'm basically, I'm basically trying to do to a certain degree, um, basically to summarize the current academic viewpoint on certain aspects. Mm -hmm. And for that, yeah, sometimes I, you need quotes. I would say too that even like my my credentials aren't exactly like great. I'm not like, you know, I don't have a doctorate or a master's or anything like that. And so for me, I think that, um, sort of showing, yeah, you know, I'm, I don't have all this, all these, um, you know, I don't even have my university degree or anything yet. So I'm going to show what all these academics say about this topic. I won't, I won't tell you the opinion. Um, you know, I'll give you the brief summary of, of, you know, what I understand and, uh, back as much as I can up with, um, as many different sources and quotes and primary documents and, and, and things like that. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us, Griffin. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And be sure to check out his channel, Armchair Historian, on YouTube. It will be linked in the description. And thank you for listening. And see you next time. Bye.